Hi, this is Presh Talwalkar. Consider two trains that are 100 kilometers apart. If each train moves at 50 kilometers per hour, how quickly will the two trains meet? One way to solve this problem is by considering the combined velocities of the two trains. We can add up 50 plus 50 to get 100 kilometers per hour. We can then calculate the time it takes them to meet by dividing the total distance they travel by their combined velocity. This gives us a result of one hour. Now consider a trickier variation. Imagine each train is moving at 75% the speed of light, so they're going very, very quickly. How quickly will the two trains meet? One way to solve this problem is we'll try adding up the velocities. We'll say that the two velocities together will be 75 plus 75%, which equals 150% the speed of light. So if you were an observer on the left train, you would actually see the observer on the right train moving at 50% faster than the speed of light. And that's something really bizarre because we know that no object is gonna move faster than the speed of light. So what's going on here? It's actually something very tricky and it goes to the question of how are we measuring time and speed? So imagine a train on the left is moving with velocity u and a train on the right is moving with velocity v. Our question is if you're an observer on the left train, how quickly are you going to perceive the right train to be moving towards you? To solve this problem, we want to use the special relativity velocity addition formula for collinear movement. This states the observer on the left train will view the right train as moving at the speed of u plus v divided by 1 plus u times v over c squared. The factor in the denominator is going to give us a correction to make sure that nothing travels faster than the speed of light. Now you don't need to always use this formula. If your trains are moving at say 50 kilometers per hour, you can actually just add up u plus v. The reason is that if the speeds you're dealing with are much slower than the speed of light, the denominator will actually become approximately one because the two speeds are very slow compared to the speed of light. So this formula will actually reduce to just adding up the two velocities, u plus v. So that's why when we had 50 kilometers per hour, you could actually just add up the two velocities. However, when the two speeds are much faster, like 75% the speed of light, you wanna make sure that the two velocities don't add up to faster than the speed of light. So we can substitute in 75% the speed of light, and we'll see that an observer on the left train will see the right train moving towards them at 0.96 the speed of light. So things get very tricky when you get closer to the speed of light, and special relativity deals with this, and part of the reason it happens is because time actually changes. So in the rest of the video, I'm going to give you some intuition about special relativity and try and give you some sense of where this formula is coming from. So we'll start out with the thought experiment. A light clock is something that consists of a mirror at the top and then a bottom mirror, which is also a sensor. The distance between the mirrors will be a length L. From the bottom mirror, we're going to shine a beam of light and it's gonna bounce off the top mirror and it's gonna come back and hit the sensor. And that's gonna be one tick of the clock. So each time the light goes up and then comes down, that's one tick of the clock. We go up and down, that's one tick of the clock. And again, this is one tick of the clock. So the first question is how frequently is this clock going to tick? We can calculate this by considering the distance the light travels and dividing by the speed of light. The light is traveling back and forth, so one tick distance will be two times the length between the mirrors, and then we divide by the speed of light. So we calculate the time of one tick will be two times the length divided by the speed of light. Now let's make things interesting. Now let's put this light clock in motion. We're gonna be stationary and observing someone that's moving with this light clock at velocity v. So you can imagine that we're an observer outside and someone is on a train that's moving with velocity v and we're observing how we perceive their light clock to be working. So the person who's on the train is actually gonna have this light clock moving very normally. The light's just gonna bounce off the centers of the mirrors and operate very normally. But we outside the train are actually going to see this light is moving in an apparent path that's an upside down V. So let me show you what I'm talking about. 
When the light clock is in motion, this is the path of light we're going to see. The light is actually bouncing off the mirror and it actually looks like it's going in a V. It's bouncing and then bouncing down. So we actually see that the light is traveling a longer distance than just going back and forth. So this is going to change the perception of time. So let's look at the geometry of the situation. For one tick of the clock, we want to measure what's our perception of the time that it takes for this light to bounce off the mirror and come back. So the light is bouncing off in an apparent upside down V shape and we want to calculate the distance that that light is traveling. We can calculate the tick of the clock by calculating the distance the light travels divided by the speed of light. Now an important assumption here is that we're going to assume the speed of light is going to be the same in all frames of reference. So even though that person is on a train moving at velocity v, that light is still going to move at the same speed of light. So what's the distance the light travels? Well first we're going to calculate the base of this triangle. We know that the train is moving for one tick delta t prime and it moves at a velocity v. So the entire base will be v times delta t prime. So each of these legs will be one half of V times delta T prime. The distance between the two mirrors is L and now we can calculate the hypotenuse of one of the triangles because this is a right triangle by using the Pythagorean theorem. So the hypotenuse will be the square root of the sum of the squares of the legs and that will be the same for both of the hypotenuses. So we now have the total distance traveled by the light apparent to us and we can divide that by the speed of light to measure our perception of one tick of this clock. We can simplify the formula by solving for delta t prime and we'll get that delta t prime equals 2l over c divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. 2l times c if you recall was our formula for delta t. So we've actually created a relationship between one tick of the clock in motion and one to the clock that was stationary. In other words one tick of the clock that's in motion at velocity v will equal one tick of the clock that's stationary divided by this correction factor. We can say that one over the square root of one minus v squared over c squared is this uh, variable gamma. So we'll say that delta t prime equals gamma times delta t. Now gamma, if, v, if the velocity is equal to zero, gamma is going to equal one. That means the two ticks of the clock will be the same if the velocity is zero. However, if velocity gets to be more than zero, then gamma will be greater than one. So we actually have found that the time when you're moving at velocity v is different than the time when you're stationary. You multiply it by this variable gamma, which is also known as the Lorentz factor. And what we've deduced here is a phenomenon known as time dilation. We will perceive a clock that's in motion as moving slower. The one tick takes longer. It looks like the clock is actually running slow. What this means is that time is actually moving slower as you go faster. It's not a mechanical error that the clock has some problem with it. It actually is the case that the tick of this light clock is going to be slow, is going to take longer. And this is not just a theoretical phenomenon in our thought experiment. This is actually something that GPS has to take into account for in their clocks as well as other effects of relativity. If they didn't do this, they would actually be off by several kilometers every day. So now, in order to get to the formula for the addition of velocities, we're gonna have to go over one more concept. This is what happens when you have a moving frame and you wanna change your coordinates. So imagine we have a frame of reference, we have some coordinates here, and all we're gonna care about is just the x coordinate. What we're going to do is imagine this coordinate system is going to be put on a train that's moving at velocity v. So when you're on a train, you only care about things relative to the train. You might care about seats that are in the front of the train or the back of the train. You're not worried that the train is moving under a velocity v. So you have a different coordinate system than someone who's outside the train is going to say, hey, that train is also moving away. I don't just care about the front and the back of the train. I also care about where the train is relative to me. So if this train is moving, you could have a new set of coordinate system, x prime, that's going to be just relative to the, to the velocity of the train, this uniform velocity v. And we want to know how can you change between coordinates of someone who's in the train and just comparing coordinates locally inside the train 
versus someone who's outside the train saying, hey, I know you have your local coordinates, but I also want to compare the velocity that you're moving. So the classical way to do this is the Galilean transformation. You can get your old coordinate systems as equaling the local coordinate systems x prime plus v times t prime. The other transformation is that time is going to be equal to t prime. What these two together are saying is that velocities will add up together and that time is absolute. If you wanted to change coordinates in the other direction, you would calculate for the inverse operations. Now we know that these things are not true. If you had velocities that would add, you would actually have speeds that go above the speed of light. And we also know that time is not absolute because we just showed with the time clock that time dilation is a concept. So we need to correct for these change of coordinates in a different way for special relativity. It's known as the Lorentz transformation. We'll hypothesize that these coordinate transformations will look very similar to what we just had, except we have this factor k that's going to be some adjustment for time dilation and other things in special relativity. The inverse transformation we're going to assume is going to look very similar. So can we figure out what k is if we assume these are the change of coordinates? Well, let's do a thought experiment. Let's imagine we have two frames of references that start at the origin at the same time zero, and we're going to shine a beam of light that's starting at time zero. So let's try and keep track of this beam of light. In our old coordinate system, our, co our x value is going to equal the speed of light times the time we travel. Similarly, in our new coordinate system, it's also going to be the speed of light times our time that we keep in this coordinate system, t prime. So we can substitute these values into our assumed values for the Lorentz transformation, and we get the following equations, which we can slightly simplify. Now we have two equations, and we can actually solve for k by eliminating t and t prime. We end up with the result that k is equal to gamma, or 1 divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. So this Lorentz factor that we saw in time dilation actually comes out in, these in this Lorentz transformation that we're going to use for a change of coordinates. So we end up with the result that these are the change of coordinate systems when we're using the Lorentz transformation. And there's a similar transformation for time, which I'm not going to derive in this video, but it also involves this Lorentz factor. So if we assume these uh, are the Lorentz transformation, we can now come to our velocity addition formula. So let's imagine that an object moves at a, rel at a perceived speed of u prime in a frame that's moving at a speed of v. So one way to interpret this is let's imagine you're on a train moving at a speed of v and you are on that train and you are moving at some speed, you're walking forward at a speed relative to the train u prime. How are you going to add up u prime and v? How is someone on the outside going to see your speed because you're walking and the train is also moving? So that's the question we want to answer. So what is the speed of the observer to someone in a stationary frame? How can we add up u prime and v prime and v? So in our notation of the coordinate transformations, we have that u prime is equal to dx prime over dt prime. That's our speed in our local coordinate system. And what we want is we want the, the speed in the old coordinate system, which will be dx over dt. We can derive this by taking differentials and dividing from our Lorentz transformation. So we'll take the differential of our x transformation. We'll take the differential of our t transformation. Now we'll take the quotient of these two. And now we'll divide by dt prime. Now we have dx prime over dt prime in the numerator and denominator, which we can substitute, which equals u prime. So the result we end up with is that dx over dt is equal to u prime plus v divided by 1 plus v times u prime over c squared. And this is exactly the velocity addition formula I presented at the beginning of the video. In order to add up the two velocities, we add up the velocities, but then we have this correction factor to make sure that the two velocities don't add up faster than the speed of light. So special relativity has some very interesting implications for how we can observe time and how we observe speed.
Thanks for watching this video. Please subscribe to my channel. I make videos on math and game theory. You can catch me on my blog, Mind Your Decisions, which you can follow on Facebook, Google Plus, and Patreon. You can catch me on social media at Presh Talwalker. And if you like this video, please check out my books. There are links in the video description.